and Ohio fracking is made possible through a grant from the US EPA to help Ohio facilities better understand the implications of their energy choices. The grant activities for this project include workshops and webinars such as this one to inform Ohio stakeholders about current trends in Ohio energy development. Also under the grant, Ohio University is augmenting a, a database that we created to track admissions changes statewide. Uh, a week ago, September 27th, we hosted over 90 attendees and an in-person workshop in Columbus that covered these issues in depth. Uh, the presentations from that workshop, information about our projects, and the recording of this webinar can be found at our website, www.ohio.edu backslash CE3. The topic of today's webinar is a hot topic in our state. It's an important one that affects communities, local governments, and industry. Uh, we learned just last week from the U.S. Energy Information Administration that it's estimated that the U.S. will be the world's top producer of petroleum and natural gas hydrocarbons in 2013, surpassing Russia and Saudi Arabia. This is due in no small part to natural gas developments in Ohio and across the country. Our webinar today focuses on the environmental, the economic, and the energy development implications of shale in Ohio, specifically as it relates to Ohio's water resource availability, wastewater disposal practices, the importance of baseline monitoring, and moreover, the importance of planning ahead. Our expert panelists today plan to cover this topic from a variety of perspectives, and I'd like to extend my thanks to our strong panel of speakers for joining us. I have several logistical responsibilities in opening up today's meeting. First, as Alyssa said, if you have a question that you'd like to submit to our panelists or our staff during the session, we ask that you use the question field on the GoToWebinar navigation pane to type in a question. Uh, we will try to get to as many questions as possible after the, present, uh, after the presentations have concluded. Second, a link to the, a brief online evaluation will be emailed to you after the webinar. Please take a few minutes to provide us with some feedback of today's session so that we can learn how to improve our, for the future, and we do pay attention to those. And finally, watch for information about our next webinar in early November, which we are calling an update on combined heat and power and waste energy recovery in Ohio. We'll, we'll keep you posted on those details as they uh, become available. Uh, with that, I think I've covered all of my logistical bases, and we hope you, that you enjoy the dialogue today. And feel free, uh, feel sure, and I feel sure that you will take something useful away from this webinar. It's now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's webinar. Jane Harf. Uh, Jane Harf became the first director of the University Clean Energy Alliance of Ohio, or UCEAO, in 2008. In this capacity, she leads the organization's project implementation, partnership development, and government outreach. Previously, Jane spent 10 years in various leaderships, leadership positions at American Electric Power. Uh, Jane served as executive director of the Ohio Low-Level Radioactive Waste Facility Development Authority and as Deputy Director for Policy and Legislation at Ohio EPA. Her work with environmental policy began as state government liaison for the Ohio chapter of the Sierra Club, and her involvement with higher education began as an instructor of political science at Denison University in Granville. Jane received a bachelor's degree from Indiana University and a master's degree in political science from the Ohio State University it has been my pleasure to work with Jane for many years now, and I respect her depth and knowledge on energy and environmental issues. Uh, UCAO's Shale Energy Working Group is exploring the complexities around the water energy nexus, so she brings a unique perspective to this issue. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Jane. Uh, Jane, please take it away. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate that introduction, and um, I have certainly benefited from working you and with the, um, the folks at Ohio University at the Voinovich School. As Scott mentioned, the University Clean Energy Alliance is an organization of public and private colleges and universities with a commitment to advanced energy research and education, business collaboration, and governmental outreach. Founded in 2007, we continue to look for ways to better serve our members. The academic community and the state of Ohio, as it became clear that shale exploration would be an important part of the energy landscape, UCAO formed a Shale Energy Initiatives Working Group. The group is led by Andy Thomas at Cleveland State University, 
and it's composed of representatives from UCAO member institutions, as well as trade associations, law firms, and state agencies. The working group is currently organizing a Shale Academy program to provide one-day courses on topics related to all aspects of shale and oil and gas development. If you would like to learn more about the Shale Academy or the working group, uh, please let me know. We would welcome your participation. And if you would like to learn more about AO, please visit our website at www.uceao.org. I'm now going to introduce the panelists in the order in which they will be presenting. After they have completed their presentations, we will have time for questions. Please, uh, as, as it has been mentioned a couple of times now, uh, if you will type in your question. And um, at the end of the presentations, we will try to get to as many of the questions as possible. Our first presenter today is Ted Lazier. Ted is currently serving as Deputy Chief in the Division of Soil and Water Resources at The Ohio Department of Natural Resources. He has worked for ODNR for more than 27 years. For over 17 years, he has served on core management teams for the Division of Water and the Division of Soil and Water Resources, including serving as chief of that division. Ted worked with three Ohio governors, their counterparts in other Great Lakes states and provinces, and critical stakeholders on the development and implementation of the important Great Lakes St. Lawrence River Basin Water Resources Compact. He earned a BS in civil engineering and an MBA from The Ohio State University, and he is a registered professional engineer in Ohio. Ted will be discussing the availability of water for shale development in Ohio. Jen Bowman will speak next. Jen is a senior environmental project manager at The Ohio University Voinovich School and works regularly with the school's environmental, water, and GIS teams. She has developed an online interactive evaluation system for the Division of Mineral Resource Management at ODNR for tracking the success of acid mine drainage remediation in Appalachian coal watersheds. Jen also teaches a course titled Credible Data Training for Chemical Water Quality Assessment and coordinates the training of area watershed sampling volunteers. Her other research interests include evaluating headwater streams' biological health, PCB contamination of stream sediments, and long-term monitoring water to identify trends in chemical and biological changes. She will be discussing the Sugarbush Project on baseline monitoring. Next, we have Natalie Cruz. Natalie is an assistant professor of environmental studies at the Voinovich School. She holds a PhD in civil engineering and geosciences from Newcastle University and a BS in civil engineering with a minor in geological sciences from Ohio University. She completed her postdoctoral research for the Sir Joseph Swan Institute for Energy Research at Newcastle University. She has won numerous awards, including the British Marshall Scholarship, Best Paper Award from Mine, Water, and Environment, and the Barry M. Goldwater and Morris K. Udall, Morris K. Udall Scholarships, two scholarships named after United States Senators. Along with her collaborators, Natalie has completed research funded by the American Electric Power Foundation, the U.S. Department of Energy, the Research Partnership to Secure Energy for America, the, U the European Union, and Coal India, with a focus on mining, oil and gas, and industrial water pollution. She will provide an update on research focused on recycling fracking fluids. Finally, we will hear from Sean Logan. Sean was named as Chief of Conservation at the Muskingum Watershed Conservancy District in 2011. In this capacity, he oversees the district's conservation operations and management, which include forest and timber harvest and planting, agricultural activities, water quality testing, partnerships with other agencies involved in flood reduction and water conservation, and mineral resources management. Sean served as ODNR director from 2007 to 2010. He was an elected member of the Ohio House of Representatives from 1990 to 2000, and he was a Columbiana County Commissioner from 2001 to 2007. 
He is a graduate of Muskingum University with a bachelor's degree in political science and speech communication. And he received his law degree from Sean will discuss the impact of water withdrawal. So there you have our panel for today. And uh, I encourage you to take notes and write in any questions you have. And at this time, I'm going to hand it over to Ted. OK, thank you, Jane. And um, I really want to say uh, thank you for the opportunity to the CE3 Consortium uh, for putting this uh, webinar together and allowing me the opportunity to talk about water use in Ohio and specifically as it relates to the uh, oil and gas operations. And I believe Alyssa is going to pull up the uh, PowerPoint presentation. There we go. And so for, for my piece of the webinar, I'm going to speak uh, generally about the water withdrawal rights in Ohio and the regulations affecting those water withdrawal rights. And then um, I will also briefly touch on the Great Lakes Compact, um, although it really does not affect the shale play necessarily, but it does have the potential to do so. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, just in general water use and water availability in Ohio and in particular in the area of uh, the shale play. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Um, in Ohio, we have, we are what's called a riparian rights state. And within that right, both surface water use and groundwater use are protected under the Ohio Constitution. And it gives a, a property owner the right to a reasonable use of the water that either flows by, flows through, is on, and I'll add, I, the groundwater under their property. They have a reasonable use right to that water. And um, in, in the Constitution, the, um, the citing is Article 1, Section 19B. In paragraph C, it refers to groundwater that a property owner has a property interest in the reasonable use of the groundwater underlying the property owner's land. And then in paragraph D, uh, speaking to the surface water rights, an owner of riparian land has a property interest in the reasonable use of the water in a lake or water course located on or flowing through the owner's riparian land. So when we talk about reasonable use, just what is that? And in Ohio, reasonable use basically is defined by the courts. So if, uh, uh, for example, there are two users along a stream corridor, and let's say the upstream user perhaps is using more than is available that's causing problems for the downstream owner, and denying the reasonable use of that downstream owner, it would be upon the downstream owner to basically, through civil litigation, take that suit uh, to the courts. And the courts would uh, settle the conflict between the two users. And as a guide, though, within the administrative or higher revised code, there are parameters or criteria that the courts can use in, in helping determine the reasonable use of the water. And there are nine different criteria. You see here on the screen, uh, one of those, the purpose of the use, the suitability of the use to the water course, lake, or aquifer, the economic value of that use, the social value of that use, the extent and the amount of harm that that use might cause, the practicality 
of avoiding the harm by adjusting the use or method, the practicality of adjusting the quantity of water used, the protection of existing values of water uses, land, investments, and enterprises, and the justice of requiring the user causing the harm to bear any loss. So in summary, with a riparian rights state, any withdrawals that might unreasonably interfere with the withdrawals of uh, other landowners using the same stream or aquifer may be subject to liability through civil lit lit litigation. That kind of gives the framework for water use. And then some general water rights and regulations. Um, we have in Ohio our water registration program. And what that requires is that any facility that has the capacity to withdraw more than 100,000 gallons per day, they must register that facility with the state of Ohio, with the Division of Soil and Water Resources here at ODNR. And I say, I want to point out that we're talking about capacity and not actual use. So uh, basically 100,000 gallons per day is a, about the same as a 70 gallon a minute pump. So if someone has the ability whether or not they actually use it uh, or actually withdraw that much or not, if they have the capacity to withdraw 100,000 gallons, they need to register with the state of Ohio. And then annually, they report to us the amount of water withdrawn on a monthly basis. So for each month of, throughout that year, they report to us how much water they withdrew. And then we compile that information and have that on an annual basis. And I do want to point out um, that it, this is not a permit to withdraw. It's not a regulation to limit or place on it certain criteria about how the withdrawal is made, but it is only a registration requirement. Now what we do have with regards to permitting in Ohio we do have a diversion permit. Uh, actually, we're going to have two sets now with the Great Lakes Compact. We have diversions of water from the Ohio River Basin into the Lake Erie Basin. And then we also have constraints and rules regarding diversions out of the Lake Erie Basin. In essence, the, there are prohibitions against diverting water out of the Great Lakes Basin with certain exceptions. So for a, a diversion from the Ohio River Basin into the Lake Erie Basin, if there is a diversion of 100,000 gallons over a 30-day period, essentially 3 million gallons per month, and there's no return flow, then that would uh, a permit would be required from the Department of Natural Resources. And we also have in our law a what we call, referred to as a consumptive use permit. Essentially what that means is if there is a new or increased withdrawal that would result in a consumptive use of 2 million gallons per day, averaged over any 30-day period, essentially 60 million gallons in a month consumed, then that withdrawer would have to apply for and receive a permit from the Department of Natural Resources. So those two, those two laws I just referred to would, would um, apply, generally speaking, to the area of the shale play in eastern Ohio. And I mentioned, and I only want to talk about this briefly though, but the, uh, we do have the Great Lakes St. Lawrence River Basin Water Resources Compact, and there are certain rules within the compact that apply to water management, and I'll say in the Lake Erie Basin within Ohio. But for all intents and purposes, at least at this point in time, most of the shale play, if not all of the shale play, is taking place within the Ohio River Basin. So I really don't want to go into the, the compact that much, other than to say there are certain regulations that uh, apply if there were large water withdrawals in the Lake Erie Basin 
and or if there were attempts to have diversions out of the Lake Erie Basin into the Ohio River Basin. Okay, now um, that, that's just a very general outline of what we have in Ohio with regards to water use and regulations in Ohio. I want to just talk a little bit about water availability. And I pulled some information. Um, I don't have this on slides. I don't know if folks would like to take notes on this or not. But <clears throat> as an example, um, I pulled the uh, uh, climatic region that's called the Northeast Hills. It's a seven-county area in Ohio. It encompasses Carroll, Columbiana, Harrison, Jefferson, Mahoning, Stark, and Tuscaroras counties. <clears throat> and within that seven county area, normally throughout a, a, what would be considered a normal year, obviously there's going to be fluctuations of, of more than and less than. Under normal year, the amount of precipitation that falls on that seven county area is about 38 0.5 inches of precip. <clears throat> that amount of precipitation is equivalent to 2,232.5 billion gallons of water. Now, as an example, in 2011, which was somewhat of a wet year, of precipitation that fell on that seven county area was actually 3,171 billion gallons or about 150 percent of normal. Now in Ohio, in, in the statewide, we use about 8 billion gallons of water or withdraw about 8 billion gallons of water per day. But in comparison, Ohio receives about 30 trillion gallons of precip in a typical year. Um, and I did some rough calculations, some estimating. Um, if we assumed that sometime into the future, we're not there yet, but sometime into the future, if we were at a point where we were drilling, uh, let's say, 1,200 wells per year and or fracking 1,200 wells per year, and if we assume a, uh, an estimated volume of 4.5 million gallons per well, that would equate to about 5.4 billion gallons of water are needed to frack those 1,200 wells per year. Breaking that down into a cubic feet per second, that's equivalent to about 23 cubic feet per second. Um, from that, you can, in terms of the volume of water available, there's, there appears to be plenty of water available, not just for the oil and gas industry, but for all uses. Um, that 5.4 billion gallons would be equivalent to about less than a tenth of inch of precipitation over that seven county area. That, that same amount of rainfall equals about 5.4 billion gallons of water. And, um, and I just pulled up I went to the USGS stream gauging site, and although the federal government shut down at this time, I think the uh, information is still accurate at this time. But I looked at some of the flows and in some of the creeks within the shale play area, and at, today I saw for Yellow Creek, which uh, flows in through into Jefferson County, uh, Yellow Creek at Hammondsville, the the um, flow was 54 CFS, or cubic feet per second. In uh, the Muskingum River at McConnellsville, the flow was 3,700 cubic feet per second. And I looked at uh, the New Philadelphia, the Tuscaroras River at New Philadelphia, the flow today was 3,310 cubic feet per second. So I'm, I'm put, I want to share that just to kind of put in perspective how much water would actually be needed to frack 1,200 wells, assuming 4.5 million gallons per well, and the amount of flow that is relative to the amount of flow in, in some of the creeks within that area. 
So all that to say there are there is enough water supply available for the uses within that area. Um, but at the same time, we do need to manage that effective at managing the water resources. I mean, obviously, if we had those 1,200 wells all being fracked at the same time, and they all pulled water from the same place at the same time, obviously that could cause uh, some impacts. And we are working with all the users uh, to avoid those. And when, when and if need be, we offer technical assistance to help avoid such problems. And with that, I will uh, end my talk for now and try to answer any, question, any questions that may come later. Thank you. We're now going to go ahead and switch over to Jen Bowman and Natalie Cruz. Let me go ahead and pull up your presentation. One moment here. Thanks, Alyssa. And you should be all set, Jen. Okay, thank you. Um, Natalie and I are going to share this, today a project that um, we started um, a year or two ago now. This is uh, looking at the baseline groundwater quality in Athens, Belmont, and the surrounding counties. Um, and the, the onset of this project was for folks in Athens County um, as the hydraulic fracturing uh, leases were being sold in this area and folks were getting um, alarmed about uh, water quality resources, we realized there was a need to do some baseline sampling. So in any of the environmental um, arena, whether you're talking about air or surface water or groundwater, when there's a potential damage to the environment um, at threat, you know, a threat that's there, baseline monitoring is the way to protect everybody involved. So having that baseline data protects industry from any pre-existing contamination that may exist um, in the area and it also protects landowners that would give them that um, leverage to um, have the backing to restore to prior conditions if needed from an environmental damage that may occur. So that's just a little bit of background on um, how this project uh, got rolling. Alyssa, do I have a advance here? Of this. Next slide. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a list of our funders and partners. The Sugar Bush Foundation, I'd like to thank them for um, their support. We worked with three different laboratories one here at OU, at Ohio University's campus, the Institute for Sustainable Energy and the Environment, we call it the ISEE Laboratory. We had um, Ohio Environmental Protection Agency and Analytical Associates. So we could have uh, a variety of um, sources of uh, analysis so that we could compare results. Next slide. So again, here's, um, you know, the pending um, issue was potential contamination that may occur from hydraulic fracturing as it came into this area. You have a cocktail of different chemicals that could be in use that you could have potential spills on the surface, you could have potential groundwater um, contamination, you could have flowback, well integrity. These are just some of the things that um, were in the minds of the people in this area that um, felt that the baseline monitoring would be helpful. Next slide. We had 32 sites located throughout Athens, Hocking, Meigs, Perry, and Belmont counties. You can see the red stars signify um, our asset mine drainage open discharges. We're in southeast Ohio here where we have open flowing water from um, deep mines, coal mines, and we wanted to make sure that those were included in our sampling. Um, 
uh, sampling area. The red or the, the blue are plumbed and unplumbed wells, drinking water wells, and then our green stars are our springs. Um, in Belmont and Guernsey, we have um, we actually had four locations. The, the blue star in the middle represents two deep wells that are uh, drilled into the Dysart Woods area. So uh, I have included just a couple photos here of uh, some of our, our stations. We had nine plumbed sites, so this would be drinking um, water resources for folks in these counties uh, where we you know, sampled from their, inside their houses or on their farm. We had eight unplumbed where we used our own um, pump to pull water up and sample, and some of these represented uh, up springs um, or unplumbed uh, groundwater. We also worked with water treatment plants around this area. We had six water treatment plant sites where we collected samples directly from the production well. And then we had five asset mine drainage discharge sites, um, as you can see, sampled here. Where these are um, deep deep mines um, that are emergent water coming up from the the old coal mines, abandoned coal mines. Okay, so like I said, we worked with three different laboratories. Um, this is a list of our field parameters. Some of the major ions and cations are trace elements and our list of organic chemicals. So we had a very extensive list of um, parameters that we were evaluating, and we used the three different laboratories so we could compare results from those three different um, sources. We sampled each of those um, sites three times, so we had just under 100 samples that we looked at. Okay, so we have produced a uh, final report, I'm happy to say it's not in progress anymore, it was complete this summer, and we have a report that's available online at our um, CE3 website um, for anyone who's interested in the full report. What I sh I'm going to show you here is a set of box plots for the water quality conditions that were found, and we've separated those into two different categories, one for the asset mine drainage sites since the chemistry and the water um, parameters there are so different than our natural groundwater um, drinking sources. Um, but in a nutshell, the concentrations that we found that were above um, maximum contaminant level, or above our MCL, at our mine sites, we had a, an exceedance of aluminum and arsenic, which is um, usual for this area to have elevated um, aluminum and arsenic from our abandoned mine areas, and in our groundwater sites we had elevated lead and arsenic, and the arsenic on the groundwater sites was only elevated from one of our laboratories um, of the three that we sent the samples off to. The lead was only at one site as well, that was um, a site that we weren't, it was too narrow, the diameter of the, the uh, well was too narrow for our pump to um, pool water out, so this was a stagnant water that was sitting in the well, just on that one site. None of the other sites had elevated lead. And then uh, um, all of our organic chemicals that were tested for were all below detection level. So here's just a list. Um, you can see the asset mine drainage there on your left and the groundwater sites on your right. You can see if you look at the scale, we're in micrograms per liter there. Aluminum is very high at our asset mine drainage sites compared to the groundwater sites. There's the arsenic. Again, the red crosshair is our average. We have our, our maximum and our min. This is our median here. And then the 75th and 25th percentile. There's our lead. So you can see that one outlier that we had from one of our wells. All the other ones were very low uh, at our groundwater sites. Iron, obviously, is going to be elevated at our acid mine drainage sites. And then we get into some of our organic chemicals. just wanted to show you 
Most of these were very tight and similar, meaning they were at or below detection level. So there's our methane. You can see a little bit more variation there at our asset mine drainage sites. All of our groundwater sites were at or below the detection level for the laboratory reporting levels. Benzene. Toluene. So these are, again, these are all at or below detection level. And there's a list of all of the organic chemicals that we looked at and the volatile organic chemicals that were at or below detection level. Um, I included this slide here. This is just a, a look at the producing and drilled and permit wells. This goes through 2012. Um, so as you see this, this obviously is increasing. We all know this. Um, and the need for doing baseline sampling um, is that much more important um, to have. And, you know, the thought here was as this is advancing, um, you know, towards the Athens area, we wanted to have this baseline monitoring. This is one study. It would be nice to have more robust studies for the, more of the surrounding counties as the advance of this um, uh, moves further towards our area. Next slide. Okay, um, there's the Utica permitted wells. Um, again, so we were here looking in around Athens area. Um, as you can see, the advance here in this direction. We would like to do these similar type of studies. Yeah, and um, you know, closer to the, that advance. And there's the Marcellus. Um, next, we're going to go through some of our new and upcoming research. Like I said, that was data that we collected in. 2011, 2012, um, and what we have been working on recently is uh, a database for Ohio where folks can input groundwater. We already have a database like this for surface water, but we didn't have one developed for groundwater. Um, so this is at our watersheddata.com website um, where we can now go in and add monitoring uh, results for our groundwater um, resources. And the way this, I'm just going to show you a couple um, screenshots here, but you can take a look at it yourself at watershedata.com. Um, again, like I said, it's for all of Ohio. If you kind of key into the, the red point there in the middle, um, you can zoom in to this area. Once you get close enough, you can have the aerial. What's nice here is you can also see your surface water streams on top of your aerial. Um, you can add new points, you can populate it with the site description, where it's located, landowner information, depth of your well, um, and then you can pull open a data sheet that you can populate with the 166 different parameters that we sampled for. We thought was a pretty all-inclusive list, um, so you can see some of them there. That's the second part of the list, and it goes on and on. I didn't put all the sheets in here. Um, but if you're interest, anyone's interested in being able to utilize this resource and add um, their groundwater data, please contact me later on. I'm going to turn this over to Natalie. So um, as we kept moving with our, you know, developing our research into um, shale and the impacts of shale, one of the things that becomes um, really obvious, at least in this part of the state, is um, that we really need to keep developing um, our technologies for managing wastewater. And so I'm just going to give you the brief kind of three-slide overview of some new work that we're doing um, through the Russ College of Engineering and, and Technology um, between Russ College and the Boynton School. So um, the flow back and produce water that's coming back from um, these wells tends to be really high total suspended solids, and it's a real challenge to treat that water for discharge or reuse. Um, there are a lot of limitations to that. Um, so, you know, there are current management practices that can be applied to these waters, so things like membrane separa separation or thermal technologies or chemical precipitation, but each of them have either drawbacks technologically or expense drawbacks. 
And so, you know, right now most of the treatment technologies that are widely used um, cost, um, I guess, in the order of three um, three dollars per barrel or um, or greater. Injection right now, um, which is used um, used pretty frequently, partly because the treatment treatment technologies have a lot of technical technological disadvantages, um, can range more in the order of maybe four to eight dollars per barrel. So it's a reasonably expensive um, proposition. So one of the things that we're doing um, as uh, with this research group with the engineering school is working on developing a, a process to um, treat water for reuse or discharge. So this is your this is your uh, two minute engineering uh, engineering lecture. So um, it's a multi scale um, process and relies upon um, first pre treatment. So um, things like filtration for suspended solids, UV treatment, um, UV treatment to remove um, bacterial content, um, precipitation to a precipitation unit to precipitate. Um, salts out like barium salts or some of the heavy chloride salts, um, and then an, a unit uh, to absorb naturally occurring radioactive material because ultimately, you know, a lot of the byproducts of this whole process, the ideas that they use, and so removing uh, naturally occurring radioactive material before reuse of byproducts is ends up being really important. So then. Um, we use something called a supercritical reactor, which heats the wastewater to be on the supercritical point. Um, and there's a lot of details that go into supercritical water, but one of the most important things to, to um, remember here is that supercritical water versus normal water, um, the different, one of the major differences is that almost everything dissolves in water below the supercritical point. But once you heat it up and add enough pressure to make water supercritical, things don't stay dissolved in it. So all these salts that would normally be dissolved in water because it's such a good um, solvent um, precipitate out. So a lot of those those um, sodium and chloride salts will come out and could be and could then be reused. So the idea here is that you know our our initial estimates are that you could do this for less than a dollar and fifty cents per barrel, but we're um, still kind of in the development phases of both the technology but also the economic modeling behind it. So this project is um, being funded through um, several different project partners, but the um, research partnership to secure energy for America is the major funder. So it's about a $2.6 million effort right now. Um, and we've got maybe uh, 20 months left on this, on this initial project. So um, I guess stay tuned for those results. And that's Jen and I done if you guys want to move on to Sean. Thank you, Natalie. I will switch it over to Sean's presentation now. One moment, Sean. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the Muskingum watershed, well, let's wait till we get to the yeah, one, slide. Yeah, one second here. And Sean, you should have controls now. Okay. Let me just make sure that uh, I got that right, right? Okay. The Muskingum Watershed Conservancy District is in its 80th year. We are a political subdivision of the state of Ohio uh, as with a three-part mission uh, as responsible stewards of uh, providing the benefits of flood reduction, conservation, and recreation. We own 54,000 acres of land and water in eastern and north central Ohio, um, providing for those three functions in all sections. We cover about 20 percent of the state. We are entirely within the Ohio River Basin. The uh, gold is the Wahonding uh, sub-watershed of the Muskingum River. The orange is the Tuscarors, and then the brown is what's considered the main stem or the, the lower Muskingum River basin. The system, we are the uh, local partner with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers 
in providing for flood protection. We actually uh, predate the Tennessee Valley Authority. Uh, that is, um, we are the um, uh, main partner for uh, providing for the flood protection uh, within the system. The size of the canisters on the screen here show the uh, size of the flood control capacity. So if anybody is familiar with the Mohawk Dam um, at, uh, on the Wahondine, uh west of Coshocton, it's a very large reservoir uh, and a very large uh, dry dam, for instance. So in the heart of the Utica, is essentially Atwood, Leesville, Tappan, Clendenning, Piedmont, and Seneca Lakes. Um, these reservoirs, as I started to mention, are the first of the kind uh, in North America, uh, maybe the world, that uh, developed the concept of actually having a permanent pool of water in conjunction with a uh, flood reduction capacity above that conservation pool, or what we sometimes, what is also known as uh, summer summer pool. So uh, these lakes uh, in this system is what uh, Franklin uh, Delano Roosevelt asked uh, the uh, engineer to go uh, with the lessons learned in the Muskingum River Basin to go begin the Tennessee Valley Authority. So our our uh, lessons learned here are what um, help make uh, the TVA what it is today. And so there's a lot of acreage and land associated. And when the district was created and the reservoirs were established in the headwaters of the uh, different tributaries that lead to the main stem of the Muskingum River, uh, there was significant sheet erosion. And the, uh, the establishing the, sh the uh, shoreline around the reservoirs was very important. But the map here shows uh, within um, one, two, and three mile uh, radius of the shoreline of the permits, uh, well permits that have been issued so far. And one of the ways that uh, we handle um, this issue of being, uh, we, well, let me back up here real quick. So each, each one of those reservoirs, we have received at least six requests for water supply for hydraulic fracturing. Um, and the requests continue to come, and they may come directly from an EMP, uh, Exploration and Production uh, Oil and Gas Company, drilling company, or they may come from a water, what's called a water transfer company that, that is hired by the EMP company to transfer water from its source to the well site, or they may come just from pure brokers that may or may not have a transfer uh, service as well. So we have received a tremendous amount of requests. And the district had a policy of water supply that was more for uh, like road construction, uh, for a concrete use, temporary. And so there was a need to update the short-term water supply policy, uh, which there is a separate long-term water supply policy because the revised code provides two different authorities for the district to have uh, water supply, short term and long term. And so the short term policy that was recommended and adopted by the Board of Directors for MWCD in May of this year divides it into category A and B. Uh, a is uh, for construction purposes and, and smaller quantities. And category B is for mineral production and other large consumptive uses. And that, suppo that supply policy has helped uh, it created an impact, a positive impact, by reducing 22,242 80-barrel tanker trucks from May of 2012 through September 2013 via five direct supply agreements um, from our reservoirs and, and no, um, no trucking uh, of the water, any, any water cell agreement that we have under a water, short-term water supply agreement cannot be trucked. And so, and we do not have any trucks at our shoreline reservoirs. And um, 
in, instead we have developed a pretty strong agreement in an example of an agreement um, is is it is shown here and there's there's other uh, items uh, attached to the agreement um, and this is an example of uh, an agreement with uh, Gulfport Energy at Piedmont Reservoir the most recent uh, completed agreement um, which was um, for the Millican pad uh, permit well number 1-4 H off of the Millican pad in Harrison in um, uh, Harrison County actually is where this one is located. The reservoir is, is located in Harrison County, but um, the agreement is for this, this particular to, to hydraulically fracture this particular well. Uh, the law, these, the uh, agreement that we have with uh, Entero at Seneca Reservoir is for um, the three months periods at a time according to our policy, but it's feeding into a system that Intero is developing around Seneca Reservoir in Belmont Noble Counties, or I'm sorry, Noble and Guernsey Counties, uh, that uh, has multiple sources of water supply, so not one water source is being stressed. And the heart of our policy is to help reduce the pressure that may be occurring on smaller, maybe inappropriate inappropriately sized bodies of water or maybe even help reduce the pressure on using groundwater for hydraulic fracturing and instead allow um, surface water from large impoundments such as the reservoirs that were and these reservoirs were designed with water supply in mind uh, 80 years ago as a matter of fact um, six of the reservoirs actually have pipes in the dam for water supply Including uh, four of the ones that are in the this, that are the six that are in the target area of the uh, or the fairway, if you will, of the Utica. But in paragraph three is an elevation trigger. So uh, there's a there's a conservation pool, and then there's uh, in each agreement we have a a curtailment elevation uh, and a cessation uh, elevation. In addition to that, our chief engineer can uh, stop uh, turn off the spigot, if you will for whatever reason, not even any reason given, uh, not, uh, not subject to any interpretation. It just can happen because we feel that it is the right thing to do. So it's very tight agreements and that the, the um, purchaser is responsible for any contingency plans that is uh, other than uh, the reservoir that is the subject of the agreement. This is a screenshot from the MWCD.org website on station or um, Flood protection, go to lake levels, and uh, this is the screen that you will see. And uh, highlighted there are the three reservoirs that are have been the subject of agreements. Uh, Clendenning, uh, there have been four wells um, hydraulically fractured from water out of Clendenning, and um, uh, two, or I'm sorry, uh, four wells out of Piedmont as well. Seneca is where the entire agreement, and it is about to begin. Uh, probably this week uh, to have withdrawals taking place with the Intero agreement at uh, Seneca. But just for instance, uh, yesterday when this screenshot was taken, you can see the outflow in cubic feet per second, 133.38. If you were to convert that to uh, gallons over a day, the equivalent of what the Army Corps of Engineers who operates and owns the uh, dam structures at all these reservoirs uh, the Corps was releasing 86 million gallons a day uh, based upon that uh, CFS uh, rate uh, there uh, yesterday. So uh, we have support from the Ohio Township Association, the Nature Conservancy, and we even developed a, um, uh, an, an, a requirement that any pumps have to be sterilized even if they were used completely within the Muskingum River Basin or even the Ohio River Basin uh, so as to help control uh, invasive species from reservoir to reservoir or from wherever the pumps may have been. We also are continually uh, looking to increase our knowledge in a strong partnership with USGS 
this was the first uh, investigation report uh, that we had commissioned uh, through USGS for uh, Atwood, Lisa, and Tappan. The other reservoirs are being conducted and should be completed uh, about June of next year. Here's an example uh, last year of uh, Connaughton Creek in Sherrodsville, Ohio, near Sherrodsville, Ohio. Um, the tanker truck there on the right is uh, the, the previous picture of uh, 22,000 of those have been reduced by the uh, five water supply agreements that I've mentioned. This is an actual site. I'm standing on a public right of way, a, a state, state highway on a bridge over Connaughton Creek. So they probably most likely had paid this landowner the going rate from what we understand is about $10,000 to use their riparian rights that Ted Lozier mentioned earlier in the presentation to, uh, to supply water. They do not, uh, the typical agreement for this type of an arrangement and the left this picture on the left is the actual uh, uh, pump that is withdrawing from the stream and then it goes into the tanks on the right, and then uh, those help provide a multiple levels of flowback uh, pr to prevent flowback. And then on the sh on the screen, there is the um, uh, where the trucks will back up and, and can uh, load up the water there. So that's an 80 barrel uh, water tanker, um, and the, um, uh, the 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 this is an example. They do not. They normally do not pay per gallon like they do from a large reservoir. Versus, this is Clendenning last year uh, in May of last year, uh, the first water cell agreement uh, at uh, for the Boy Scout pad uh, from Clendenning Reservoir in Harrison County, not in Ham Township. Uh, this is for one well, and this is a close up of the pumps. One is a backup, and then the other is um, the uh, primary. We uh, required uh, diking, of course, and to extra care on the uh, fuel that is used uh, to uh, to pump those. We recently required one of the agreements that we had at Piedmont. We required them to carry hand carry the diesel fuel for the pumps because of the steepness of the grade. And so that's some of the extra example, some of the extra precautions that we are taking to ensure that this is done appropriately. Here's an example of the temporary above ground welded plastic pipe. This is the this was an existing access road to what is called the uh, Boy Scout Beach. Um, this is on MWCD land uh, that is uh, shared in conjunction with the uh, uh, Fort Steuben District Boy Scouts. And that is the Boy Scout pad. And on the right, uh, coming in from the right, that black line is the supply line directly to the pad. And this uh, this picture is actually during the actual uh, frack stage, hydraulic fracturing stage. And here's why we want to help protect it also. Uh, that's my son, uh, Jonathan. That's a 41-inch uh, muskie, catch and release, November 1, 2011. It was a pretty great day for us. I caught one that was 42 inches. and that's the end of my presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Sean. I am going to turn it back over to Jane here in just one minute. Jane, okay. if you would uh, like to go ahead and uh, ask some of the questions that have come in, I turn it over to you now. Um, sure. I. Um, there's a couple of questions that, that um, our participants have written in, and I would encourage others of you to do so as well. And then um, we have a couple of other questions here uh, that we will ask after we have covered those that have come in from um, our viewers. Um, the first one is directed to Ted. And uh, since the water used in hydraulic fracturing is consumed, uh, largely taken out of the water cycle. Does this change how withdrawals for hydraulic fracturing are treated by ODNR versus non-consumptive withdrawals? For instance, cooling water for electric generation. Okay. Um, 
Well, in, in general, it, it does not it does not change uh, what we do with regards to the laws that we currently operate under. Um, the amount consumed is is and other users obviously consume water as well. Um, for example, the with power generation, uh, whether or not you have uh, once through cooling and or cooling towers, uh, you're going to have uh, water consumption. Um, and it, folks probably know this, but power generation is the single largest water user in Ohio. But uh, I don't know. I hope hopefully that answers the question. Um, with regards to the amount consumed. So that there is uh, obviously with the fracking, uh, the amount of water used for hydraulic fracturing, we do consider that a 100% uh, consumptive use. Obviously, they're working towards um, recycling of some of the uh, flow back water to be reused. Uh, but any fresh water that is withdrawn eventually um, would be consumed in the hydraulic fracturing process. Thank you. Um, I, I actually have a note here that someone has written that your audio can't be heard. Now, I did hear it. Did anyone else have difficulty, any of the other panelists? We were fine here, Jay. Because someone just added it. Well, someone we, just we said. Fine. OK, well, others, OK. Um, the, another question uh, came in, and that is, can the public look up withdrawing facilities? If you see a tanker withdrawing water from a local stream, how can you tell if they are doing it legally? And I suppose that would probably be for Ted, but maybe for Sean or others as well. Yeah, well, I, I can maybe start with that. And if others want to uh, uh, chime in, we currently we do receive many calls. And the answer to the question is uh, what you would need to do, I guess, would be to call our office um, and report to us what you're seeing and, and that sort of thing. And then we can uh, follow up with that to determine whether or not that's a, um, uh, a registered facility, if they are withdrawing water appropriately. Uh, we have worked with both the County Commissioners Association and the Ohio Township Association with regards to you know issues like perhaps maybe a tanker truck pulling up onto a township bridge or county bridge and um, maybe putting their hose in the stream and withdrawing water. Um, clearly, that's not legal, even from a perspective of public safety. Um, however, that same truck could be pulled off to the side of the road, similar to the picture that uh, Sean Logan had showed earlier. Maybe they have permission from the landowner uh, to pull up alongside the creek and withdraw water at that point. But uh, and if folks want to know uh, who's registered, um, where those facilities are located, they can contact our office and we can provide that information. Anyone else on that question? Yes, I would like to add, add that withdrawing water, it's, it's illegal to withdraw water uh, from MWCD reservoirs uh, without a permit, regardless of the amount. Um, we need to have um, uh, a notification and the, the withdrawal needs to have permission. And I just, I, I, I kind of I failed to really emphasize that the, that, that withdrawal side of Connaughton Creek that I showed, that was on private land. And so, um, you know, the the other item, if you know the landowner, is to contact the private landowner and let them know that someone is withdrawing water from what would appear to be their land and or at least accessing their riparian rights. Um, but that stream versus a large reservoir, just FYI, Clendenning Reservoir has 8.6 billion gallons at Summer Pool. And that, uh, that picture of the from last year in May was at Summer Pool, and it was estimated that 
the 11 million gallons that was contracted to be withdrawn from Clendenning Reservoir, if there was no water flowing in and it was all static, it would only drop the water level of Clendenning Reservoir a quarter of an inch, about 40 sheets of paper worth. So I just wanted to, uh, I forgot to drive that point home, the, the difference between appropriate, appropriately sized uh, water sources. Uh, but we have had some, we actually have had a prosecution of an illegal water withdrawal from MWCD property uh, this year in uh, Coshocton County. So we have prosecuted for those that have withdrawn illegally from MWCD uh, land that may be along a river or um, uh, a reservoir or directly from uh, the reservoir. So we exercise our repairing rights uh, albeit we are public, we do have repairing rights, and we do protect those repairing rights for public interest. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Okay, we have another question that relates, again, to registrations and permits. Um, besides withdrawal registrations or permits, under 1509.06, permits are to include water sourcing information. How many drillers are providing sourcing data that aren't included in registrations or permits, and where can this information be found? I think that was probably for Ted. Okay, yeah. And um, I could uh, try to answer that. Um, if, um, as, as, as I understand it, the part of the oil and gas permitting process, uh, I, I believe that's what the question is referring to, that the uh, applicant needs to demonstrate the source of the supply. Um, and as, as far as I can tell at this point, any, any of those sources or any of those applicants, um, the, they are registered uh, with through our registration program, because obviously they're going to have the capacity to withdraw, withdraw at least 100,000 gallons a day. Um, currently, we have 234 active, uh, what we term active facilities that are registered for the purpose of hydraulic fracturing. So in, in terms of, uh, I think the question was too, is where can this, where can they get this information with regards to the, um, the oil and gas permit? Um, I would encourage them to contact the uh, Division of Oil and Gas Resources Management here at the department, and uh, they could get that information. But, and I uh, think that... Oh, go ahead. Um, well, I was just going to say, I think that... Um, really emphasizes what we, we need to make clear is that there are an awful lot of folks in government, state and federal, who are um, involved in the regulation and monitoring um, of these uh, drilling efforts. And obviously yours is a very important piece of that puzzle, but there are other divisions at DNR as well as EPA um, that have a have a hand in it as well, and it's a kind of a complicated puzzle. But we appreciate your being here to um, to provide the information that you have from your division. Yeah, and you know, I want to add we we do coordinate with our sister division uh, a lot on the with regards to water withdrawal and water use, and um, even uh, when we get concerns uh, concern calls regarding uh, maybe there's a creek that's in a low flow stage or um, it's a, a, a stream that has uh, endangered species in it and there are low flows. We get those kind of calls. Uh, we work with our sister division and we also work with the water withdrawers. Um, sometimes they're not always just the oil and gas industry but there are other users as well. And in some cases we've actually call the water withdrawer, the registered facility, and you know, basically explain to them the concerns that, of calls that we've received and then worked with them to either uh, change lo source, change sources, um, reduce withdrawals, uh, whatever is necessary 
to uh, help ensure that there are no impacts to that particular uh, stream or that, you know, that I'll say that sub-basin. So. Okay. Um, there's a, another question here that although it really is addressed I, I, to the department, I think others can um, speak to it as well, particularly maybe Natalie or Jen. And it has to do with um, best, management, best management practices for withdrawals from streams based on seasonal flow rates and the presence of rare or endangered species. Are there, you know, are we working with the drilling companies and watershed organizations in the pursuit of those best management practices? Are we doing it, uh, and, and do we have some data from the studies that have been done that would help to develop them? Um, as far as I know, there's not an overarching effort to address those things, but ultimately if there is, um, if there are rare, threatened, or endangered species, um, there are federal regulations that, um, that govern um, water withdrawals associated with that. Um, but ultimately, I don't think that I know of an overarching, um, an overarching effort to try to develop those best man management practices. But I think that's certainly a direction that we really need to be going with some of this science in, in Ohio. I do know of one situation where uh, companies have voluntarily agreed not to withdraw uh, from a scenic river that may have uh, the appropriate habitat for an endangered species. So there has been a, there does appear to be, and then from our perspective, there has been a tremendous amount of, of um, I guess, respect and responsibility from those that have been involved with withdrawal. As I've stopped that quite a few that are in tributaries that lead to our reservoirs uh, because as you've seen there's not the same regulatory structure in the high river basin as there is in the Great Lakes basin. We're, con we're very concerned as the repairian rights owner of the reservoirs as to what's being withdrawn upstream and they've been very, they appear to be very responsible in understanding the reasonable use doctrine and uh, but uh, we also understand that we we do our our policy. Uh, there's uh, the, both sides are mad, if you will, uh, are are disappointed that the policy is either providing too much or too little, and uh, essentially our policy is to only have, allow those that have our mineral rights leased or are uh, in a on an adjacent pad that could potentially produce MWCD minerals in the future, and so this whole question of of working with the industry now more than ever before, water owners and water users need to coordinate with water regulators. We are not a water regulator, we are a water owner. And so we, but we also have leasing and so we want to help reduce the impact of our leasing decisions and that's why uh, water supply from NWCD reservoirs is limited to those who have leased our minerals to reduce that 22,000 tanker trucks that we've talked about uh, that to date that have already been reduced from uh, the township and state highways. So there is a great opportunity here for have greater coordination and, uh, and, it's, and it's very much needed that, as well. But there, there are willing parties on, on all sides that does appear, so it's important. And I, and I would like to um, sort of follow on that. That's a great segue to a comment that was sent in by one of our participants that the Yellow Creek and Captima Creek watershed groups have uh, reached out to the oil and gas company representatives and are serving on technical committees. So if anyone on this uh, webinar is interested in um, doing something like that, serving on a technical committee that the companies are establishing uh, another way to have an input at the local level. Um, well, I think we are just over our time, and I don't know, Alyssa, if uh, there, there are no other questions that came in um, from our listeners, but um, we could, I don't know, do we have time for one more question here or not? Um, I think if you'd, if you'd like to go ahead with one more question, we can do that, and then we'll wrap up. Okay. Well, um, and this is this is something that has, that comes from the news. Actually, the recent flooding in Colorado, uh, in which they have experienced significant oil and gas issues as a result of that flooding, uh, should Ohio be engaged in flood mitigation planning, 
What about locating wells on floodplains um, or avoiding closer proximity? I know many of our siting laws uh, take into account those kinds of issues. And I think any of our panelists could address that. Uh, well, this is Ted. I can start. Um, you know, we have uh, our Ohio floodplain management program that uh, rests here in the Division of Soil and Water Resources. And again, we work with our sister division, Oil and Gas Resources Management. Uh, that is one of the criteria that is reviewed uh, with regards to applications. And um, I know for the most part, uh, the production companies really do not want to uh, place their pads or their equipment and, and so forth within uh, the floodplain areas and to help mitigate or reduce the risk. Now, with that said, we also know that there are ingress, egress roads. There is uh, pipelines, perhaps, that do go through, uh, into and through the floodplain areas. And we're working uh, with the Oil and Gas Resources Management Division, as well as uh, the production or pipeline facilities to make sure that those are put in to reduce as much risk as possible. Um, I think it's probably about time. That's a good way to wrap up. Yes, um, um, Jane, this is Scott. I'll, I'll just uh, I'll do a, I'll do a quick wrap up. Thank you, Jane. I appreciate you uh, your willingness and your your ability to uh, facilitate today's dialogue. I want to thank our panelists, Ted, Sean, Natalie, and Jen. Um, really appreciate your time and your insights. As you can all tell, this is a very uh, important topic when we talk about preserving environment, environmental protection and, and the interface with the, the shale, oil, and gas uh, industry. Uh, much more to be determined as we move forward here in this state. Uh, very interesting um, and very lively discussion, um, certainly not determined by today. Just a couple of things administratively. Uh, please respond to the, to the survey that you received from us uh, today or tomorrow so that we can kind of continue to make uh, uh, incremental uh, uh, increases in the, the quality and the quantity of these, these webinars certainly want to respond to your needs. Um, and also, if you're interested in uh, getting, a, getting an archived copy of today's webinar, it will be posted to our web website probably within the next seven days. Um, so please check our website at www.ohio.edu backslash CE3, and we will make that available to you. Uh, once again, thank you to our panelists, and I, I appreciate their time and insights, and we'll, we'll sign off today. Have a great day.